Welcome to my talk, Teaching Replication. I'm Nicole Jans and I'm an Assistant Professor in International Relations at the University of Nottingham. Using replications of published work in the classroom is a great tool for students to learn statistics. But they also learn something even more important. How to do empirical research with integrity. My talk introduces the idea of constructive replications, how to do them in the classroom, and the pitfalls to avoid. And it builds on the fundamental idea that students should learn replications as a positive and constructive way to build on previous work. If you take only one thing away from this talk, it's the golden rule, replicate others as you would like to be replicated yourself. Okay. When the replication crisis hit different disciplines, for example, cancer research, political science, economics, um, replications started booming and becoming more popular as well. And at the same time, original authors felt shamed or harshly judged, and they defended their work against what they called the replication bullies or the replication police, uh, which is trying to find errors and discredit other stories, uh, other scholars and their work. And that was, in a way, something, you know, these, this sentiment you could read in the newspaper articles about scandals in different fields, about irreproducible results. And it did feel, for an original author, that replication is, you know, almost a matter of life and death, at least in terms of their career. So either all your results replicated or, di or they didn't. So either your, stu stu you know, your study was successful or it wasn't. And this is something that I see as an outdated way of describing re replication. Replication 1.0. It's all about judgment. And that's not very helpful to go forward. I advocate for a new way of doing replications. Replications 2.0. Uh, which is all about overcoming obstacles. So in the picture, uh, you these are all scholars and they are all building on each other's work and supporting each other. So the goal really is to engage in organized skepticism um, to make science a truly self-correcting enterprise, as Merton has proposed. And this can be done constructively without pulling anyone down um, from overcoming the obstacle. In the end, researchers should work together by overcoming these obstacles of, trick, for example, trickery measurements or methods that need to be optimized and improved, and they can do that collectively. So what we need is to achieve a research culture in which replications become more accepted and human errors are normalized. And for replications, this means we need to undertake them in a very constructive way. And of course, this brings me to the classroom. This is highly relevant for students. We are basically socializing students into our disciplines and we want them to start with a model of constructive replication. Replication 2.0. So, how can we teach constructive replications? The most fundamental pillar of a constructive replication is clarity and transparent planning. And on the most basic level, that basically means that students need to be fully aware of the purpose of their project. Um, and here I have a slide on the difference between duplication and replication. Depending on which field you're working in, this might be called internal or external replication. And there are a whole lot of different terms. Um, but essentially, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to distinguish between duplication and replication. Um, on one end, replication is simply the verification of a previous study. On the other hand, uh, at the other end, it's an extension of previous work. On the left side, you can see duplication, a term that I adopted from political scientist Gary King. And here, students are setting out to understand if any errors occurred in the original study. They are basically doing a verification check. And
And we should not discount this. This is actually great for the classroom context. To context. Uh, the students follow all the steps and, and the original author has taken. They run the same code. They use the same data. And then they can under see, you know, they can see if they got the same result or not. And then they can discuss possibly why they didn't get the same, as same result. So em emulating published scholars, th that's basically what you're doing here, is a fantastic way for students to learn how to do statistics. They closely follow the original author's uh, decisions on data and model specification. So they can really learn and get more confidence um, that they can run similar analyses themselves. But again, in the end, the question is, did they get the same result or not? And if not, there has to be some discussion in the classroom, why not? Um, and what you can learn from it and how to communicate that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see um, something that I would call a full replication. This is the testing the robustness of the research results. So for example, you're wondering, are there any suboptimal methods used? Is there a new data um, uh, set or a new measurement that has recently come out that captures a concept much better? And do the results really hold in a general way or do they apply to a narrow context? And if you change one thing in the setup, suddenly they can't, generalized, uh, can't be generalized anymore. So in this sort of setup, if you do this with the students, often actually I do a duplication first with my students and then we move on to replication, if we have time. Um, the students uh, do have to collect new data. They off and or, I should say, um, they run new mo methods and models. And then when you look at the results, they almost always are a little bit different because they are using new data, maybe updated data, maybe a new measurement, maybe an improved method. It would not be unsurprising if the results change. They can change substantially or they can change just a little bit. And that is again something that's up for discussion in the classroom. So when you run replications in the classroom, students need to know what is asked of them. Is it, you know, duplication, replication, how far do they need to go? And there is more guidance uh, that um, course instructors can give at the start um, that help with transparency and clarity. So at the top of the slide, you can see clear aim. Are students conducting a replication or a duplication? And then there are other ways in which students and uh, yeah, in which students and teams, maybe you're putting them into teams, uh, can be very transparent and they probably want to work really reproducibly themselves. Um, so first of all, selection of the study. How are the students going to select the original study that they are going to replicate or duplicate? Is it going to be at random? The, you know, does the teacher, uh, the professor give them uh, the study, how, how does that happen? That needs to be very clear. And then second, um, in some cases it makes sense that students pre-register um, their attempt to replicate. If this is a small class project, maybe only, you know, a workshop, that may not be necessary. But if the students have, if the, some of the students want to publish their replication later, or if, if, if that's basically on the table, for anyone in the class, maybe um, the most advanced students, it can be a good idea to pre-register the replication attempt because later no one can accuse them of error hunting or, you know, massaging the data to find a different result from the original study and, and error hunting. So it can, may, it can be very good practice to pre-register um, a, a pre-analysis plan of the replication. It's almost like a safeguard but it also helps the students to set out a plan for themselves. So it's a good exercise in any case. The third point is cross-check. So who will cross-check the replication results before they are reported or possibly even submitted to a journal? Um, I often let my own students cross-check. So they work in teams and then they exchange the replication report and the code before they are submitted to me. 
But obviously, if this is something that is going for uh, for submission to a journal, it would make a lot of sense for someone in their lab who is more senior or the course instructor or if it's a, a PhD student um, for the supervisor or advisor to have a look at it. Um, because it would be quite embarrassing if you submit a faulty replication um, to a journal. Not the end of the world. Human, uh, human error is, you know, human. But still, cross-checks are good and you can build that into, um, into the syllabus, at which point students exchange the work amongst each other, for example. The fourth point where guidance is necessary is um, the original authors. So everyone has to decide, do they want their students to contact the original authors, possibly even ask them to help and collaborate? Um, if yes, can you help them with an email template? The language around asking someone for their data and telling them you're going to replicate them has to be very... Um, professional and non-threatening, um, at least in my opinion. Um, by the way, students don't have to contact the original authors. It's not an obligation, but it can be really helpful for them to engage in a positive exchange with them because often, you know, there might be a variable in there that is really hard to understand. And if you approach an original author in the right way, they might even be flattered that they are helping out a student to learn statistics. And finally, publication. Do students plan a submission to, the, to a journal or is this just for learning purposes? And this is something that students should know. They need to discuss what is the big plan. And if they are writing to the original authors, they should also be open about it. There's no use in telling an original author that you are just doing this for practice and then later you submit to a journal and bash that original article. That's not good. Uh, that's not going to be helpful for anyone. My students, some of them have actually published um, their replication uh, studies in in one form or another, or added it as a chapter into their PhD as a sort of um, pilot study. So um, just helping students um, to find out what they will do with it later, and being very clear and transparent about it. Uh, can make it a better classroom experience. The next question is, which study should students pick? This is a, one of the most difficult things um, in my courses. Students often have picked a paper that they found really interesting, but they weren't able to handle the methods. So first of all, it should be some sort of research that is really in interesting, it's really relevant, it may be something that has policy impact, so it should be something that you, your students can be passionate about. Uh, maybe it's something where the results have been widely accepted for a while, but they've never been checked. Maybe there are control variables uh, missing. Um, I often have students who ask me, you know, you said this variable is really important, but this paper didn't include it. And so that's one of the reasons why you could say, okay, well, let's see what happens if you do include it. And often uh, a reason to replicate a paper is that there, it has been using a certain measurement, let's say in the field of democracy or human rights, maybe a new measurement has recently been published, and you want to add that um, uh, to to a data set and just, you know, find out what happens with the analysis. How robust is it in light of the new measurements? So here are the practical steps in a replication study. We've gone a step beyond that and tried to turn it into a full replication. So here the question is, you know, how can we add value to that? How do we extend the pure verification? So this could happen with new data, new variables, new model specifications, and maybe even new theory contributions. Maybe there is an original hypothesis that wasn't um, particularly well formulated. Maybe there are conditioning effects or, you know, different theory that can guide you towards extending the original study. 
it doesn't always mean that you're just playing around with new data. It's all, it should be theory guided. This can take up to six weeks. Some of my students have only done that after our class has finished, or at least they have completed it later. Um, again, this gives students a lot of confidence. It's, it's a really great tool. Um, it can be a lot of fun. And again, you'd have to compare the results um, with the original study and write it up in a constructive way. And at some point here, uh, let me just pull up the next one. I have put that before journal submission, but at any point in the class, once the students have started working together um, and working on the replication, I think they should cross-check the results. Definitely before journal submission, um, as, I, as, I, um, as I mentioned before. Now, this can be relatively fast if the student is advanced or has great help from an advisor or supervisor, or it can take months if they have other things to do and, um, uh, you know, don't have the support of a whole class. So here, this journal submission of all of my students happened in at least one semester after they have done my class. Again, there's a lot of sweating, a lot of sweating involved here. But at this point, a full replication is completed. It wasn't simply a verification, but it was in fact an extension and a robustness check and almost a new study. Um, and a lot of students of mine have published that in journals. It's harder to publish a simple verification or duplication. It's easier to publish a full replication because you are adding value. So more about how that can happen in the classroom um, is in my uh, paper, uh, which is based on a workshop that I, that I ran at Cambridge for a few years. And this paper is also open access available at uh, the Open Science Framework. You can see the URL in red here. Now let's talk about the second fundamental pillar of a constructive replication. And that is rhetorical sensitivity. This is relevant at all points during which students um, run a replication project. So, of course, when they interact with the original author, should they email them? Um, but also when students talk about the replications in class, it's really important to take a um, constructive tone and not just say, well, you know, that author did a really sloppy job here. Um, you know, the way we talk about authors when they're not listening, um, that matters as well. So students should talk about replications and the original authors with respect in class. It sounds banal, but in my class, it has happened that the tone has slipped a little bit um, and that it would be good if that did ha didn't happen. Of course, rhetorical sensitivity matters when the students write up their final assignment for the class um, because that is, uh, you know, as any essay, it should be well written and professionally written. And then finally, when they publish it, should students want to submit this to a journal, um, the language should be absolutely appropriate and non-confrontational. And actually, the rhetorical sensitivity is a learning objective in itself. In some disciplines, it's relatively common to be quite harsh, or in some contexts, I don't have a problem with honesty and being blunt and clear about certain results and certain um, errors, but that can all be said in a constructive way, because we are basically training, training the future cohorts of scientists and how they will talk to each other. So here are a few pointers on how to um, yeah, be rhetorically sensitive. First of all, avoid binary judgments. Present the diverging results step by step. So at each step, you're going to have to say, um, up until this point in the code or in the analysis, everything has matched. My results have matched with the original study. But at this next step, something has started diverging. And then you can start, the students can start interpreting why those differences occurred. Why, you know, why 
just take a guess or, or just think about why did the results change here? What, it could be an error in the original study. It could be that you obviously you, you might have changed something yourself. Or it could be that the students have made an error as well. Um, so this is really uh, something where groups can discuss it with each other. They can cross-check each other. And ideally, don't start with a binary judgment where you'd say, oh, the study has already failed. Next, don't make it personal. So in writing up replication results, uh, you know, professional, uh, courteous, um, friendly, collaborative language should be used. Um, I'll show a few examples of cases where that wasn't done um, in a second. And don't forget the positive contribution of the original author. The students have picked a particular paper for a reason. Maybe it's a really important topic or the paper made a really good contribution. Maybe they didn't go far enough. Um, so you pick the paper for a reason. It can't be all bad. Um, and, you know, that is something you can, you can say in the replication. You know, um, just mention why, what the positive contribution of the paper is before you go into why it didn't, um, didn't fully replicate and what happened there. And then finally, that goes for everyone, and I apologize for the ice cream picture. Um, honest mistakes are human. Um, and I think it's really important for replicators or student replicators to keep looking forward and not backwards. Of course, you are making some sort of judgment on the original study, um, and you're bringing very good reasons why certain things replicated and others didn't. But the student's judgment is not going to be final. There might be the next replicator coming along and saying, well, maybe the student did a mistake. So all the, you know, all knowledge builds on each other and um, we should always look forward and not just stand there saying, I've, I've had the final say here, this study does not replicate. And then finally, and again, that really helps in the student context, um, students should discuss how the wider literature can move forward from this. So again, looking forward, um, this means, of course, that students have to be, uh, you know, knowledgeable about the literature on, in this field. It's not just a, st a statistical exercise. Um, so how can the literature move forward? What have we learned that brings everyone to the point where um, research on this topic is improved? Replication 2.0, overcoming obstacles together. Now let me show you some examples um, of a communication between scholars who have replicated each other's work just to demonstrate why those, those things that I mentioned that sound very um, common sense uh, are still necessary to be, to be uh, emphasized in class. So I'm talking here about replication chains and with that I mean that you have an original study at the beginning and then the next link in the chain is a duplication or a replication. And then the next link in the chain is that the original author comments back on the replication. So this often happens when students or anyone publish a replication. You can be 99% sure that the original author is going to want to say something. And they might either publish that as a comment in the journal or they might respond on Twitter or in a personal email um, or they might write another paper where they talk about the replication and try to, sometimes they try to defend themselves. So I call that replication chains. And let's have a look at what people have written. Here is what replicators have written. So this could be a student of yours. And Herndon was a student at the point when he uh, replicated a very famous economics paper. The Reinhardt Bogov paper, I believe. Herndon wrote, We find that coding errors, selective exclusion of available data, and unconventional weighting of summary statistics led to serious errors. So that's relatively tough. Here's another, uh, um, another um, short sentence of what replicators have written. 
If we cannot even reproduce the original results using the same publicly available data, there is no need for further commentary. Um, so I, I think those were also students who did replications in class. So I think that language is still professional, but also a little bit harsh. Now here's how original authors have responded to replications. And yeah, I'll read it out first. Um, in the first example, the original authors have talked about the replication by saying the replication was less realistic, inconsistent with the substantive literature and of limited utility. The replication is fundamentally flawed. Or the replication was statistic has statistical, computational and reporting errors that invalidate its conclusions. So you can see that the original author, authors really push back because they have a reputation to defend and their own paper to defend. Um, so the language is really harsh here and depending on how the, how the replicator has written their paper, this is going to cause a chain reaction on how the original author is going to start defending their work. Now here's an example what constructive replicators write because there are better ways of communicating with each other. This is what a constructive replicator has written. This is not a critique of existing papers which faithfully report careful studies. Rather, replication with a different event, sample and time is a way to move the literature forward to assess robustness. So here you can see that they say something positive about the existing work and then they talk about how um, the replication was meant to move the literature forward and it was not meant, uh, meant to discredit an original author. And um, that's actually from the same paper here. The replication should not be taken as definitive evidence that the extant literature on overstates um, uh, that the extant literature overstates the extent of irrelevant events. That's the topic that, that this was about. Yet, the replication serves as a cautionary prompt to the next generation of work. So you can see how the language here is really very careful. Now this example um, is from um, a study called Football and Public Opinion, a Partial Replication and Extension. And in this case, um, the authors were very, let's say, gentle and constructive with the original work. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And there's only one sort of shortcoming of this example that I'm giving you here, because Busby and um, Druckmann were actually replicating their own study from a previous year. So they are talking very gently to their former selves. Now, does that mean that this example is irrelevant? I think no. On the contrary, I, this really opened my eyes and it really showed me that this replication study was almost a form of self-correction and it served exactly the point that I'm trying to make here. Uh, the point is to judge others as you want to be judged yourself. Imagine that you're looking back on one of your own previous studies and then if you feel that something is missing, a follow-up is necessary, a cross-check is in order to advance the literature, go about and do that in a constructive way. And this is something that I would really like for students to pick up on here. Um, this is how we should approach replications. In short, replicate others as you would like to be replicated yourself. This part, the second part of the talk about sensitive, um, uh, sensitive way of, of, of communicating, um, I've written that up with uh, Jeremy Fries from Stanford University in the paper with the same title as the um, Golden Rule. Um, and it's freely available um, as a preprint on OSF as well. So, I hope this has been useful 
for instructors who want to use replication in the classroom. I hope it shows that in the wider reproducibility debate, it is really important that we are clear and transparent and that we communicate constructively with each other to ensure that replication is not something to be dreaded. It's not something uh, like a witch hunt, you know, the bullies are coming. It's meant as something that is really productive. It helps students to learn statistics. It helps them to learn how authors should talk to each other and to socialize them into the discipline in a positive and forward-looking way. Thank you very much.